Warning, the following episode may contain explicit language and at least passingly graphic descriptions of a quack neurosurgical procedure. Listener discretion is advised, so discress. What does discress mean? I don't know, but it, it didn't word correct it, so it's got to be a word. Inspired by a talk at a recent medical conference in 1932, neurologist Igaz Moniz travels to France to approach a fellow physician, Maurice Decosse. Moniz wishes to discuss an idea for a new surgical procedure and field of study with one of his contemporaries. Oh, hello, Dr. Moniz. Nice to meet you. Following your many, many letters on this subject, I am interested to hear your proposal on this matter. What is this procedure you have wanting to discuss with me in person? Yes, Dr. Decoste, thank you for inviting me. Oh, I don't recall inviting you. Ouch. Either way, I thought I would discuss my proposed procedure with you, a fellow physician whom I consider to be a forward thinker in their own right. Oh, from your letters, you seem to think you've discovered the cure for mental illness. I have to say, I am quite skeptical. I am looking for a skeptical mind to help me realize my theory in this procedure. Oh, well then, have a out. Uh, what is the procedure? I think that we can all agree in this day and age, it is understood that causes of mental illness arise in the brain. Oh, more or less, I would agree. I would submit to you that we are on the cusp of a new surgical field. A surgical field whereby the goal is to cure the mentally unstable patient with a directed neurosurgical procedure. I suppose that sounds intriguing. I am calling this the field of psychosurgery. Uh, psychosurgery? Is that really the name you came up with? Well... I guess it's just the first name I came up with. It refers to using surgical procedure to affect one's underlying unstable mental process in a beneficial way. I'm afraid I'm still stuck on calling it uh, psycho surgery. Ah, uh, there'll be time later to workshop names. Let me tell you about the procedure. Oh, please do. I have come to believe, based on studies available research in the case studies at this time, that a surgical procedure to disrupt the frontal lobes of the mentally ill patient will lead to a curative improvement in their disposition. Oh, disrupt? I, I have some drawings here. You have handed me a picture of what appears to be a large hypodermic needle with a sort of wire whisk at the end of it. I, I don't follow. I believe that if this instrument is inserted into the general region of the frontal lobe of the brain, and the metallic hoop at the end of it were permitted to move back and forth, thusly... That would sever the communication of the brain tissue, which are responsible for pervasive mental illness. Well, I have no doubt that things would be disrupted, as you put it, but I'm quite skeptical of the likelihood of favorable outcomes. You're proposing that a neurosurgeon place this into the brain of a patient, sort of wiggle it around to scramble the frontal lobes. I believe that the correct terminology should be pivot the device. Whatever. Whether you're pivoting or wiggling the device, it seems very unlikely this will be helpful. This is far from an exact surgical technique, and I don't think I would like to have my good name associated with your endeavors. I see. Apropos of nothing in particular, would you remind me, Dr. DeCoste, what have you become known for? Oh, certainly. I drill holes into people's heads and inject malaria-infected blood onto their brains to try and cure the advanced dementia that results from untreated syphilis. So, you see why I came to you, right? Oh, I must admit, it's fair enough. It seems like it's my device idea that's giving you pause. Well, it's certainly not very uh, nuanced. What if we just injected alcohol into the front of the brain and sort of dissolved the tissue instead of disrupting it with a mechanical object? Now that seems more refined and scientific, for sure. Oh, totally. It'll be surgical alcohol. Of course it will. I think this could really work. Uh, no, it probably won't. Aww. <laughs> I have no idea what kind of accent that was, but it was Portuguese. It was, it was, it was clearly Portuguese. It was clearly uh, Portuguese. Uh, I go. You know, it was consistent, and I think that's what we go for nowadays. Yeah. yeah. Cases through our history, it's just Max and there and Mac and me. You gotta listen, you don't have to read. For historians, for historians, for historians. 
Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three practicing emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Gentlemen, how difficult would you say neurosurgical procedures are, really? I would assume, presume that they're really hard. Yeah, there's so it's like the biggest barrier to entry, right? You got to like, it's the brain. It must be terrifying. I, I, I don't know. So some of them, like the burr holes we talked about before, like those aren't actually that complicated. What you're saying is making a hole is not complicated. Right. But then anything else you do after that must be incredibly calm. You're basically trying to operate on jello. Well, maybe that's the difficulty. It's just getting started. And once you get going, it's just like, wow, this is easy. Yeah. I think, you know, I think if nothing else, just looking ahead at to this week's segment and topic, I mean, neurosurgery, you don't have to really overthink it, do you? <laughs> Good one. Yeah. I think if you want to know what you're doing, it's incredibly hard. Uh, that's the distinction. <laughs> and well, I, you know, I should also mention that we, we have another shout out this week. And so it was brought to my attention uh, by Karina, one of our pharmacists, I should say, one of our illustrious and venerable pharmacists, uh, who would probably describe herself as the number one super fan of our show, that October 17th through 23rd was actually also, in addition to Nurses Week and uh, Advanced Practice Providers Week and everything else we missed uh, in, in, in our previous shout outs, it also happens to have been National Pharmacist Week. And so she did promise to accept my pleas for undying forgiveness if we made it up to her and shouted out to her and her colleagues who help us out so very much when we are in our emergency department. Would you agree? Oh, here, here. Absolutely. Mike Huzzah. Silent says he doesn't Huzzah! Agree. <laughs> well, he was just slow to it. All right. Well, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone that this podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice, and it exists only to entertain. And so now, Aaron, entertain us. Do, do I get to say, are you not entertained at some point? That no, would you be do great. not. You do not. Oh, come on. Is that All right. You have to thing? begin the entertaining. What's that? Is that from a thing? Gladiator, man. It's like the best line of a bad movie. I can't believe one best picture. But anyway. Yeah, but well, your name wasn't Max when, when that movie came out. Oh, right. so yeah. that meant that everybody that cornered awesome. me and asked me if my real name was Maximus. <laughs> <laughs> Max, did you have the Caesar haircut? I did not. No. I uh, <laughs> I just had a momentary disdain for the name. I Caesar. Or my Max? name is not Maximus. It's it's Maxwell. Hmm. But then again, you know, my, I thought it was Max Good. No, my uh, my mother used to have fun with that because she used to tell me that I was named after her favorite coffee, which used to make mm-hmm. me very upset and angry as like a five year old. If Just you want to have a much name, cooler namesake. Like Folgers? <laughs> I, she used to tell me my middle name was House. True story. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been worse, man. You could have been Folgers. I'm not bitter about it. It's fine. All right. Well, let's start today with a quotation from 1891. Mm. A German psychiatrist called Gottlieb Bruchart said, quote, doctors are different by nature. One kind adheres to the old principle, first do no harm, prima non nocere. The other one says, it is better to do something than nothing. Melius anceps remedium quam nullum. I certainly belong to the second category, end quote. Not referring to Aaron, no. just to be clear. No, no, I, I'm much more probably in the first. He's more the do category. no harm category. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's an interesting tension in modern medicine, but this essay, I think, gets the tension a little bit wrong. These, these guys do. So Burkhart was a quote unquote modern psychiatrist in a time when the reform laws to make things better included the 1833 Madhouse Amendment Act and the 1866 <laughs> Idiots Act. Those are the actual names of laws. God. <laughs> to try to make things better. So there were, you know, asylums were broad sped and cared for those who couldn't care for themselves. And there was no distinction broadly between cognitive difficulties or schizophrenia, which wasn't even coined until 1908. So before that, it wasn't even schizophrenia. It was just something else. Just being um, an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> Quit being an idiot. <laughs> that was an early DSM. Yep. Oh my God. How much more simple would it have been back then? Well, right now it would be like idiot with or without psychotic features representing outward yep. negative behavior in the third <laughs> decade of life. 
not otherwise specified with us. You know what the ten. broad audience likes? ICD ten <laughs> jokes. ICD yes. ten jokes. Coding jokes. Everybody, we're here for you. It is notable that the uh, in the environment this story takes place in, as well, totally predates all known psychiatric medications and all formal types of psychotherapy, plus or minus. So Freud and psychotherapy were starting around the same time, but they weren't established at all. At their peak, asylums housed almost a half million patients in the U.S. So outside of those... What, could they have found a better term than asylum, though? Well, is, is it asylum chicken or the egg? sounds insidious. Because we may, is that because we know what it's for, though? I mean, there's, there's an old psychiatric asylum that up until recently was totally abandoned, and you could just kind of sneak in there and walk around, and it was totally creepy. And there's an old graveyard from patients that were in that site, the uh, like unmarked graves from the people that lived in the asylum. So, you know, it's Hmm. got a creepy vibe maybe because we all knew what was going on in there. But doesn't asylum mean like safety? Yeah. Right. I mean, it's seek asylum, like care, protection, safety. Yeah. So, so what we're saying is it, it it seems to like work better as not a place. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, they called them madhouses. In 1833. Um, yeah, right, yes. Is that better? Madhouse is full of idiots in the 1800s. <laughs> not great. Not great. No, I don't think it's a slow progression towards better. Yeah. So there, there arose a whole branch of interventions that was much more invasive than what was before trying to actually fix these folks. Um, a bunch of people doing something instead of nothing. Burkhart believed that the brain had certain sections that performed distinct functions, which we talked a little bit about with Phineas Gage. That was uh, popular at the time. He ascribed mental illness to overactivity of certain sections of the brain and decided that direct action might help alleviate symptoms. So he came up with a study. So he basically thought that it was like the wiring of the brain was the problem. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. It's like a little section that does the I'm angry part, or I don't know, a little section does the planning part or the math part. Like they thought they were all segmented. I see. And they knew exactly where these sections were. It, well, apparently. Yeah, but you seen that, <laughs> that drawing of the homunculus? Oh, that's right. Well, that actually like describe is... a homunculus for the audience. <laughs> homunculus. H O M O N. Wait, what? Oh, describe. Homunculus. <laughs> yeah, it's a, that si- the picture of the brain, and then they have different organs, and like each are represented by size based on what they do, or you know, like how powerful or how big the area of the brain is. I remember well, that's, that's a sensory cortex, right? So the sensory yeah, so part the of the nose brain was really big, applies. and the hands were really small. So basically, yeah. what we, when we learn neuroanatomy, you're you're shown this brain, and they have basically drawn this giant cartoon caricature on the sides of the brain where some of the areas we came to find out are governed. So the, the sensation of the nose or the face is like this giant bit of the brain. And then the, the arm and the leg are there, but they're a little bit uh, smaller. And it's uh, it's actually a cool picture. It will do much more justice for you to look up homunculus, not how Mike spelled it though. Yeah. I, I mean, so they're not entirely they're, wrong. They're, they're, they're onto something. What you're However, saying is they're in the ballpark before yeah. they decide to do neurosurgery. Yeah. And a, a little knowledge, unfortunately, turns out to be a terrible thing. So he, he just took six patients, probably from an asylum, got to say, one with what was described as mania, one with dementia, and four with just primary psychosis. So meaning mm. just these people have psychosis and we don't know why or what it is. And psychosis generally we use to describe disordered thoughts and hallucinations and delusions and so on. And there's a lot of flavors and I'm not a psychiatrist. I just know when to call one in anyway, in each of these patients, he used old trephination tools, shout out to the last episode. And then he actually took the next step of removing portions of the cerebral cortex. So the cortex, which I remember like Gore-Tex, which you always wear on the outside, is an anatomical term for the outer portion of a structure. And cerebral is the upper part of the brain. So the upper outside part of the brain, which is where all the thinking happens. He mm. sort of thought like, right, fair? I mean, uh, it's simplified. And I, like, probably I, like, get... I like your approach. That's fine. Mm-hmm. I just, I want to point out that we've done two episodes that involve putting holes into heads. Mm-hmm. And... I don't know if this has anything to do with your basement that we referenced before, but <laughs> you, you have something on your mind. No, no, I, no, the basement's fine. There's nothing down there. Just old tools. That's it. You keep jumping to 
you keep jumping to neuroviolence episodes. I <laughs> just, you, mm, well, okay. So anyway, he felt that if he cut out the parts of the brain that were causing trouble, he would improve the symptoms. The results were not great, predictably. He had one death of six with intractable seizures. One died of mm. suicide after improving slightly. Two that had no change and two that were referred to as quote unquote quieter. <laughs> Wait, on the one guy, the one person who had who died of suicide improved slightly before that. That seems that seems like a very minuscule win. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> he looked pretty good. He was looking better. Mm. Yeah, he had, he had a little more energy. This, so he, this sounds like an amazing procedure. Yeah, so great. What did the informed consent form look like? <laughs> <laughs> uh, some guy came in and undid your manacles and mm-hmm. led you out of the room to the other room. That's that was informed. That's consent. sexist, Aaron. I, or are <laughs> women in womenacles? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh gosh. So he he actually presented these findings and was roundly condemned for them. Everyone said, "Stop doing that. It's not a good idea to pull out parts of the brain." But some other people heard him, and this was the start of a controversial branch, to say the least, of medicine called psychosurgery, which consisted of specific pre- procedures to try and surgically cure mental illness. That's, so that that name is too much on the dot. It is way too much on the dot. So throughout the first part of the 20th century, I got to say a distressing, appalling explosion of psychosurgery occurred with multiple physicians all over the world, just excising parts of the brain to see what happened and follow one thread of this terrible tapestry. Nice alliteration. I work hard on that. In the 1930s. tapestry of trephination travesties. (laughs) Nice. Nice. In the 1930s, there was a landmark meeting the Second International Neurologic Congress, where a Dr. Fulton presented an experiment where two chimpanzees had their prefrontal cortex removed, so the front part of the brain. And the chimpanzees became, quote, devoid of emotional activity, end quote, and unable to show any what was called frustration activity. So they, they kind of viewed this as a win, like maybe that'd be a good thing if we just completely took away their emotions. In the audience watching intently were two neurologists, Dr. Igaz Moniz and Dr. Walter Freeman. They both went to this same concept, this same Congress. The second Congress, as you you Mm -hmm. mentioned, it was a landmark, which makes me wonder if the first Congress was pretty meh. Yeah, it didn't get much done. There was a lot of hand waving and they decided they scheduled the second Congress is probably what happened. (laughs) So (laughs) Igaz Moniz followed the same general precept in the 1930s. This is a bit later than Bruckhardt. He would perform a trepanation and then either use a bit of ethanol to kill the brain cells directly, or he would use a tool that he called a leukotome uh, to perform a leukotomy, just basically coring out small parts of the brain. My understanding, leukotomy is basically interchangeable with lobotomy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess the leukotomy could technically be smaller because you're just taking out some white matter, which is the the whole thing together is a lobotomy. Like the trephination with the leukotomy is a lobotomy? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know because they're not really removing a whole lobe hmm. when right. we talk about it. So anyway. But otomy is putting a passage into, right? Yeah, right. Because otherwise it'd be a leukectomy. Right. Yep, you're right. I'm sorry. God. No, no. You, you come up with the terminology, Aaron. You don't have to defend it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just Why trying isn't to understand how they got there. <laughs> 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 I don't know. It's an amazing picture in my head. So he's just like basically taking little core samples out of the brain. He, his theory was that mental illness came from unrestricted circulation of bad thoughts around the brain. <laughs> Sorry, I just can't even. What? He's not wrong. He's not wrong. <laughs> well, yeah, he thinks the thoughts are circulating like blood, I guess. Like they're actually mm-hmm. the, oh, uh, yeah. And by interrupting the thoughts, he could improve symptoms. So he thinks he's actually cutting the bridge the little thoughts go across right so basically the problem is this there's too much traffic down in the city so you want to <laughs> re- you want to destroy the thoroughfares yeah just of that traffic up. at a random just kind of squiggle and destructive kind of way it should improve the traffic did he try yep. jump scares at all <laughs> <laughs> you know, like when you have the hiccups like ah! i'm sure there were plenty of things that scared those people in the asylums so Dr. Mooney has published that severing the connection between the prefrontal cortex and the thalamus, which is in the deep part of the brain, doesn't matter really exactly where it is. It made people more docile, alleviating the symptoms of depression and schizophrenia. And for his work, he got the 1949 Nobel Prize. 
How in the hell did he hit that <laughs> spot? I don't, don't. Like what in the you guys have tried doing central lines without ultrasound, right? It's not easy. I don't not, think not he on the brain. Did. I well, don't no, think he did. just saying, like, he how are you just, gonna even know? You're well, not. I mean, it That's... doesn't sound like they had you know, like rigid controls. I don't think they were really going <laughs> for nuance here. Yeah, there are no CT scans. Or and and I do, kinda... I do. I'm going to have to go back to Aaron's comment of the uh, the thalamus is in the deep part of the brain because I, I I do know that a few of my former anatomy professors have found this podcast, and uh, I I I want to just point out that I didn't say that. Yeah, that's fine. They can come at me. I'm sorry. I still have the cards. It just, you know, I'm sorry. I, I really <laughs> but, apologize. Know, it's, deep, it's deep enough. It's not scratching the surface, you know? Like no, no, it's definitely not. You I mean, got you're... your deep brain and your shallow brain is how we like to divide it up. The shallow oh. brain is where all the thinking is. And the deep brain is where all the doing is. It's right. The brain is profundus. That's what I'm going to call it. I promise I learned a lot. <laughs> Well, you see, profundus means deep <laughs> in Latin. All right. All right. Now, this seems like a terrifying yet reasonable point to take a moment to see what other fascinating historical events may have been happening at that time. Three emergency physicians are sitting around talking to each other through microphones. All right. Let's do skit number two. Um. I don't. I don't have it. I don't see it in the notes. Let's do, Max. Where is uh, skit two? Look, it's not. Not that I didn't want to write a second skit this well, week. Yeah, Max. It kind of looks that way. Yeah, we we always have two skits. We can't do the show with one skit. It breaks the format. I know. I know. It. It's just that. It's what? Well, I, you know, it, it's just harder than you think to write jokes about lobotomy. No, it's not. The internet is full of them. I use them among my other sources to do the research for this show. I, I you know, that's fair. That's fair. I found plenty of them and lots of memes, but I, I'm just saying it's hard to write tasteful jokes about lobotomy. Yeah. I, I, this Max, you wrote the first skit and it was no problem. Like, I just, I don't understand what the issue is. Yeah. I mean, the first skit was easier. I, I was able to point out the absurdity of the procedure itself. Uh, the fact that anyone with, actual medical training thought that this was a good idea was kind of an easy target for the humor, I guess. But I mean, imagine, I guess, imagine pitching the idea to a credible physician of the time. I mean, that, that all made sense when I was writing it, but I just had uh, a bit of a difficult time kind of finding a different angle or another angle to poke some fun at this. Well, what about focusing on the tools, the surgical instruments for this procedure are kind of comically brutal. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I do get that. At the end of the day, though, I mean, the procedure is hammering an ice pick into someone's skull and permanently ruining their life. And this was happening within the last 100 years. And hell, there's probably some people still alive that went through this procedure. Uh, I didn't, I guess I, I guess I didn't think of that way. I don't know. Yeah. What about focusing on the ineptitude of the medical establishment at the time who couldn't recognize that this was farcical treatment? You could write something about the 1930s Congress of Neurology or whoever was arguing about why the procedure should be studied further. I mean, there's plenty of stuff there. Yeah. I mean, nothing says comic gold like medical conference banter among expert panelists. Yeah. I, I agree. Uh, I get it. Fair enough. Maybe you could just uh, write us into a skit about having difficulty coming up with skits. I don't know. That that just seems like a bit of a cop out. I, it's like using metafiction to cover up your lack of substance material. No, no, I don't think it's a cop out. It seems like an honest response to the subject. I mean, some things are just easier to joke about than others. I think our listenership would understand and appreciate the choice. You really think so? I do. I think the efforts you've put into this podcast skit writing are astounding. I think it would be, you know, reasonable to place your work among the best efforts of the literary canon to date. Oh, I don't, I don't know about that, Aaron. Aaron, what are you talking about? I just, I just thought we should take a moment to shower praise upon our colleague here. I, I think he's more than deserving of it, don't you? Wait, no, Aaron. He's making you say these things by putting them in the script. Like he's literally trying to distract everyone from the fact that he couldn't come up with a second skit for the show. Like, don't buy into this, Mike. Maybe you should listen to Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. I very much appreciate your adulation. Well, I think you more than deserve it. I, I made you this plaque here. I, actually, it's a good time to show it to you. It says. Best podcasting partner on it with a little blue ribbon. Aw, how nice. I like the frame. 
Why do you keep reading these lines, Aaron? Like Max is obviously abusing his power right now. Maybe we should do another podcast about Max's positive qualities. All right. Too far. Ow! What happened? You got carried away in Max's meta skit and started saying all these nice things about him. It was gross. I thought it was nice while it lasted. Anyway, why not just go with the neurologist conference in the 1930s idea, but instead of writing about infighting over the procedure's proclaimed benefits, you just have all the neurologists come down with sudden GI problems, leading to a chorus of farting noises. That just seems so lowbrow. Yeah, but that hasn't stopped you before. True. Very true. Well, hell, looks like I ran out of time to do the skit, though. I see this worked out nicely. Uh, I uh, sort of blacked out there for a minute. What was I? What was I saying? Oh, you were saying something about putting holes in people's heads for no real good reason. All right, so back to the main of all the preceding discussions were warm ups for our main event, Doctor Walter Jackson, the undisputed still the king of the lobotomy based on my perusing of the internet. Mm. So Dr. Jackson was actually the first neurologist in Washington, DC in 1924. So you kind of get a sense of the field, but soon he felt he could do more good with lobotomy with the lobotomy that Dr. Maurice had pioneered or even better his own procedure to sever the prefrontal cortex and the thalamus, which he developed with a neurosurgeon, Dr. James Watts. The uh, two of them figured out a procedure that they performed hundreds of times in the 1930s where they would drill a hole on either side of the skull and then, quote, with a sweeping stroke, mm. end quote, separate like the Ross? thalamus. Yes. <laughs> you just Anyway, yes, definitely Bob Ross. Separate the thalamus and the prefrontal cortex. And they published their results, I think, in JAMA. So it was definitely in the mainstream, generally 63% improvement versus 14% worsening of symptoms. I want to know how they defined improvement. <laughs> Me too. In, in 1942, I'm sorry. I didn't, yeah, I didn't go all the way back I mean, to World War II. We're just starting for us over here. Yeah, everybody's or, distracted. Like one year in, right? At least. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. So, yeah, They're so all thinking, I, uh, a lot of people distracted, not paying attention to what's going yeah. on in old JAMA. Just like, don't mind me. I'm just going to drill a hole in both sides of the skull and just do a little sweep. I, I do like, I did read a, a description of like how it was described to do it. And it literally was like, you know, you change your wrist about 43 degrees. It was insane. Uh, yeah, it's totally. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. It's insane. How did you come up with an odd number? So that like could know, be a protracted surgery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can't see you dab on. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Dang it. I dabbed. <laughs> so I didn't have time to look up all the medical studies in the 1940s because it's actually a lot. But the Wikipedia, which I use, lists the results of this procedure as mixed. Mm. Right after surgery, patients were stuporous, incontinent, and confused, probably because they had been, you know, stabbed in the brain. <laughs> stabbed is a favorable way of saying. Yeah, that's not even the most of it. Follow-up studies, yeah, they showed profound emotional blunting and lack of a lack of intellectual complexity was one way they said in hundreds of patients if they survived major complications, which included death or intractable epilepsy. You know, the mortality rate was around 5%, uh, but the rest of it was a really mixed bag. They don't say. <laughs> <laughs> the understatement of the evening. In, in a few cases, there were reports of people actually being more functional. I don't know how, but obviously it's hard to tell what would happen with this procedure. So Freeman himself, I think when he was like trumpeting how good it was, coined the term surgically induced childhood. Mm. Some of his patients were so what he called infantile that they couldn't hold conversations, which is actually probably pre-childhood. Uh, in his own unpublished memoir, I'm sure that's a riveting read, whatever stack of horrors is written out on narrow college road paper in his attic, he described <laughs> patients as more able to deal with social pressures <laughs> and, and described one patient as having the personality of an oyster. <laughs> just, just not. I, I want to I know what it, what it takes to write an unpublished memoir of yourself. <laughs> Maybe a lot of people do it. A but... pen and paper, yeah. I mean, no, I know I get that, but I mean, that's just... Yeah, but it's, it's called a memoir, so I think it's more than a journal. I think there's a lot of positive self-regard here. And he just he, he gets to write this, and he includes this. 
So Freeman felt that his experiences up until that point were successful. That's what he thought that was. That was success, but just not on an appropriate scale. He just wasn't mm. helping enough people. <laughs> so he, ex he expanded his operation. He heard of a German neurosurgeon who operated on patients through their eye sockets. Oh, God. Like at this point in the story, I'm just like, sure, why not? Um, between Wikipedia and JAMA, Freeman apparently modified his procedure to perform what's called, open quote, an ice pick lobotomy, close quote. So that's what he actually called it. And I don't think we even have ice picks anymore, but geez, those things are wicked. I'm sure it was a surgical ice pick, so it made it better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, it was, an, it was an eye. Pick. It was an eyes pick. Uh, yes, again, he's all over the wordplay today. Mm -hmm. Wow. He practiced on cadavers first and grapefruits, so you really can't Same say difference. that he wasn't thorough, really. Where are the grapefruits' eyes? <laughs> Who the hell knows? Like, is he just like, oh, somewhere in here, I just, you know, generally. And then there's no thalamus in a grapefruit, so I don't know how he figured out how to figure out where to go. But it gets, unfortunately, even worse. So the patient was given electroconvulsive treatment, a shock to the temples directly to induce seizure for this procedure. So... Those are not fun procedures. So they still, those are still used for depression in some severe, severe cases. But with like sedation. And right. So if you're going to get that, you get full sedation and you get sleepy medicine and you get monitoring and Don't you get all it's this the stuff. the sedation as it sounds like it is here. Right. Is horrifying. <laughs> this was, but so they, they'd induce seizures with these, with shocks to the temples. And then they would use the body's natural time to recovery after a seizure to do the procedure without any sort of anesthesia. So, so what you're saying is that when people have a seizure, we call it the post-ictal phase. It's just like the post-seizure phase and people are typically out of it. They're just not really sure where they are. Sometimes they're like sleepy. Sometimes they're even aggressive and it can last anywhere from 15 minutes to hours, yep. up to 24 hours, depending on yep. a whole variety of things. So basically what you're saying, Aaron, is they cause a seizure to cause that post-ictal or post-seizure stupor and went ahead and did the procedure during that. Yes. So they wouldn't have to use anesthesia. Right. No anesthesia. So the bonus is, according to... Oh, according, the, uh, uh, anyway, sorry. So the bonus is you don't have to have either a surgeon or an operating room or an anesthesiologist or monitoring or anything like that. So it's a much more portable portable intervention um, and, you know, fewer people involved so he can have a higher profit margin. You got to make neurosurgery more accessible is the thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's really what he wanted to do. He wanted to bring brain surgery to the people. So he would the, lift the upper eyelid and then the point of the ice pick was malleted back along the plane of the bridge of the nose into the brain. The bone in that region of your skull is very, very thin. So it would mm. be almost very, very, it, there wouldn't be a lot of resistance to kind of get the ice pick in there. He'd go to a depth of seven centimeters. And then he said he swept 15 degrees to either side in a specific series of cuts. Um, and then there very were specific. ones where he would say, oh, I did up and down this number of degrees or side to side. And that seemed to correlate in his mind to a specific type of procedure that was beneficial in certain cases. <laughs> you know that this guy said centimeters. You just know it. He did. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely seven centimeters. He called his ice pick the orbitoclast. Hmm. Yeah, he had a nickname. I would have called it Demon Slayer. <laughs> <laughs> Watts, the neurosurgeon, decided that this wasn't quite up to his standard, so he left Freeman. The, <laughs> but he continued. The procedure was, quote unquote, easy, uh, non-sterile. So again, easier to perform. And he hoped that broad acceptance of the procedure would help many more patients. So he started to just... So hold on. His his marketing campaign for this was, <laughs> it's a neurosurgical procedure that's really easy and non-sterile. Yes, that's exactly what his marketing campaign was. Anyone can do it. He you want easy neuro neurosurgery. You don't want that complicated crap. It's too expensive. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad Watts decided that that was too much. <laughs> the neurosurgeon's like, you know, this is, I just can't, this is not up to my standards. I'm not really feeling that whole eight plus year residency. Yeah. Easy peasy, thalamus squeezy. <laughs> he traveled the country. He went to multiple asylums. He performed this procedure on tons of patients. Two different articles state that he performed the procedure on literally thousands of patients, somewhere between four and 5,000 people. His most famous yes. client was Rosemary Kennedy of the Kennedy family, who had severe complications and was subsequently permanently disabled. 
and that actually led to what a fair amount of horror. Was she? I don't know. I didn't. You know, I didn't look into Rosemary she was in Kennedy. An asylum. Yeah, I remember reading isn't the that, story. Isn't about that this. Rosemary's Baby is about? Didn't she have a, a a break or something? A psychotic break? I don't know. I shouldn't sling mud that? at the most powerful family in the country. Oh, not anymore though. Um, performed the procedure on up to nineteen children, the youngest of which cool. was four. So he mm. did this on a four-year-old and charged about twenty-five dollars a procedure. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not sterile, so you get what you pay for, I guess. With inflation. Yikes. There is a bit of an urban legend that he had something that he traveled around in what was called a lobotomobile, but then that's disputed. <laughs> I would. I feel like there, there would be some better evidence of that. Yeah. I mean, if he actually painted it on the side, you think there'd be a picture of that? I mean, come on. Either way, very prolific. He performed his last lobotomy in 1946, but because he thought it was so cool and accessible and championed it to everybody and, hey, somebody want a Nobel Prize, over 18,000 lobotomies were performed in the U.S. by, the ni- by 1951 when they, when they started to fall out of favor. Yikes. Yeah. So after the 1950s, the procedure declined precipitously. It took a while. There were concerns about efficacy, perhaps brought on by the Rosemary Kennedy result, and medication started to be available around that time as well, so there are a lot more alternatives. You know, I don't know. Yeah, there's a little kind of softening. There's no softening this terrible tale of woe. I, I had a little writing here that said, I could see where maybe they got there. I just, yeah, I'm not going to say that. Well, it's like it, you could see that it <laughs> grows out of the impetus to want to be able to do something to I, if if you're going to try to be the most favorable in, in let's be clear we're not but i suppose maybe there was some hope that this was helpful but obviously it wasn't and it's a pretty big horror show to see how far this went yeah. right and how many people went through this procedure that was not helpful uh, extremely dangerous and completely permanently scarring right and so so I think we should go back to that first that first camp of physician, the uh, the do no yeah. harm one. How did that go again? Yeah, two camps. One says do no harm. The other says do something. So it's interesting. That, I mean, that came up in, in training, especially in emergency medicine. I mean, there was that sort of aphorism that people would sometimes use. It'd be, don't do something, just stand there. I mean, if you really are in a situation where you don't know or you have uncertainty, then it is not always the wrong thing to do to stand back and try to not make the patient worse so there's even a better book that everyone in medicine should read called the house of god that uh put forth the precept of the art of medicine is doing as much nothing as possible which is a comical oversimplification but there is a little bit of truth there that eh, when you don't know if what you're doing is a good thing you probably should not do it in favor of no action that would cause harm yeah, it's a good one to call back to for sure. I never read I'm it. I bought it. it. Like made it, I don't know, to I don't know, tenth page maybe. Not a big reader. <laughs> There's literally sex in the first page of it. I must have skipped that part. I don't remember that. <laughs> it's literally like the first page is a sex scene. Like it's that, how, I, that's it not how me. you hook a reader. I don't know what is. <laughs> the book is dark, but it is a classic and sadly accurate in a lot yeah, of ways. It has way too much truth to it uh, in, in a certain way. Yeah. Just yeah, like that's... Scrubs. Yeah, Scrubs, scrubs is, probably is probably the probably most the... accurate. Mm-hmm. Yep. I was going to say, I think I think this podcast can take that position that Scrubs is the most accurate uh, medical show TV ever. TV medical written. show. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and truthfully, it's, yeah, it's actually um, not, yeah, just there's lots of uh, creative editorialization, but well, sure. for it one is... show that basically kind of gets it yeah scrub totally. gets it yeah actually medicine wasn't terrible on it no yeah except no, for the didn't. intro when they put the x-ray up backwards like <laughs> right? that's the only yeah. thing unless that's they could say they did that on purpose later yeah well yeah they probably could even if they didn't you just that. lean into yeah. that and you're fine but how many times do you guys watch television shows and there's some medical thing in there and you're just like what the hell <laughs> like all you had to do was just somebody's got to know a guy who knows a guy that well, is in medicine or even yeah. you know, like a nurse, respiratory therapist. It's always like intubation stuff. Oh, yeah. there, there was one I saw this, <laughs> this just... guy was like unconscious, but he had a nasal cannula in his mouth. Yep. <laughs> it was like that. What? What? Oh, they, they start taping. Uh, they start taping nebulizer masks to people's faces. And they yeah. Just, no, or they take no, a stomach tube works. to the face or it's just. Yeah. Or, it's, yeah. Like um, 
Pulp Fiction, like driving the the epinephrine into the heart. Unless oh. you could argue that maybe they're trying to. <laughs> I do that. You don't do that. Pericardiosynthesis. Like maybe that's what he was doing. Maybe he knew that she had a. Only if somebody draws heart. the red dot first. That's what I need. I need the red dot driven, like drawn on there. <laughs> well, I think that's all we have for today. <laughs> <laughs> we do appreciate everyone listening. If you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback, you can be reached through our website, www.poorhistorianspod.com, and there you will find links to all of our social media sites. We do take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com, and if you're old-fashioned, send us an ornate scroll with a wax seal. That'd be way cooler and better than email. Till next time, sign off, catchphrase. wah wah wee wa. <laughs> <laughs> Say when we're done. That's it, my dudes. (laughs) That's it, my dudes. His story is his story. I think we can all agree that this day and age, it is understood that the causes of mental illness are all right. <laughs> is that bad? <laughs> I'm going to allow it. Uh, yep. He, I actually, I believed in him and that's why I allowed it. I don't, I don't yeah, even, I don't think we're offending through. anybody with that. I mean, there's yeah. just nobody on earth that sounds like that. Halfway through Max just says, I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> you you got to pick your battles. This is, you know, helping helping direct the podcast is a little bit like parenting, I think. There's just certain battles you have to pick. That's that's accurate. If anything if anybody knows about parenting, it's me. And Max still allows spanking. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, see that's just lowbrow and obvious. Lowbrow? That was in James Bond. That doesn't you, make you can't get any more highbrow than I don't that. I don't think that's the compliment you think I've it is. I've got the boost in my shite smish money penny. <laughs> So anyway, Freeman. Wait, that was from Train Spotting. <sighs> okay, I don't remember. Yeah, I should watch that movie again too. He shoots a dog with the uh, pellet gun. Yeah, but it, it's a quote from he's quoting someone from probably. James Bond. I know, yeah. but he's doing Sean Connery. But the he's doing second level quoting. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah, it's right. It's, it's like he said, meta. Okay, fair. We're in the okay. metaverse now. Yeah. Okay, fair. <laughs>